Welcome to the second lecture in my section, Land and Landscapes. This lecture is looking at one of our major themes in the course, um, landscapes, and we're particularly interested in South Africa. South Africa probably has one of the most, hmm, one of the most deeply troubled history of landscape dispossession in, in the world. Um, landscapes, as we know, are contested spaces, which are always in process. And this we know from reading Morin. She makes general points about landscapes and how geographers should think about landscapes. And so we're now bearing in mind the insights from Morin and you're going to be need to need to be thinking about um, how to apply them to South African landscapes, especially in the tutorials. So the reading you're going to do for the tutorials is extremely important uh, for my section. So there are different forces that can impact on landscapes. Um, landscapes are always in process, right? So they are constantly changing and there are different forces that are competing within the landscape. We're interested in two in terms of what I'm going to be teaching you. Um, uh, in South Africa, I think that the two major forces that have impacted on South African landscapes are first of all state policies. Uh, we've had a um, history in which the apartheid government, and even prior to that, um, has passed legislation which has shaped the landscape. And many of these state policies uh, have been racially discriminatory, and we can think of this as spatial engineering. So it's deliberate and it's done by the state. That's the one type of force which is impacting, and certainly in the past, impacted on our landscapes. All right, and then the second um, force that I think was very interesting, and we'll focus more on that in the third lecture, um, is on capitalist transformations um, of the landscape. So capitalism as a force for uh, creating value and making money from the land, that is a major force in transforming landscape. So in this lecture, I'm focusing on the state policies, the first um, bullet point there, um, the racially discriminatory uh, laws uh, which cause dispossession. Um, I find that South African students are not as well informed as they should be about the history of their country. So I'm first going to give you a background to this. And then we're going to focus specifically on the apartheid period and the violence that happened then in South African landscapes. Right, next slide. Okay, and I'm not trying to simplify. In fact, in one lecture, I'm going to be trying to tell you about South Africa's complex history um, with regard to land. Um, and really, it needs probably a whole course but I'm just going to highlight the main points. So we're not saying land dispossession began during apartheid. Land dispossession obviously took place during the colonial period. And the colonial period in the Cape goes back for a really long time, um, you know, to the 1600s, 1700s. Um, but let's say, so that's the 18th century. Um, and particularly the 19th century were very important in terms, was very important in terms of land dispossession, especially on the east coast of the country. And um, we can see the colonial period going into the 20th century. So why was there land dispossession during this time? Well, it's really because parts of South Africa were deemed suitable for settlement by European powers. At the time, um, Europe wanted access to more land for settler 
farming to accommodate its surplus population, you know, and also because if you think about England, it's a tiny place, tiny country, um, and there are lots of things that can't be produced there, which could be produced in other parts of the world. So they had this idea um, that the surplus populations from Europe, and I'm thinking Britain in particular, um, needed to be sent somewhere else. So they were um, sent in various parts of the world to establish farming. This at the time was called the New World, um, and it, did, it included not only South Africa, but it also included Australia, America, Canada, and uh, New Zealand. So here we're talking 18th and 19th century, where uh, the expansion of Europe happened um, and the setting up of these uh, settler colonies. Of course, there were already people living in all these places. Um, and very complex negotiations had to happen in order for the settler populations to get access to the land. This may have included and sometimes did include the use of force, but also it included negotiations. Um, so there was both the carrot and the stick, I suppose. Um, there's a very important book that's been written about this process in uh, Natal, which is the colony, British colony of Natal, which is on the east coast of our country, um, by Jeff Guy. Um, and in this book, um, Guy shows that the process was a complex one where there was a certain amount of negotiation. So in Natal, there was a key figure who was a colonial official called Theophilus Shepston. And this book is called Theophilus Shepston and the Forging of Natal. And as you can see, the word forging has two meanings. You can forge a document, that means um, do it in a way that's not um, um, above board, was dishonest. And the idea of forging also means to create something. You forge or you make something um, um, through a process of metalworking or something like that. You're forging something new. So it's got a double meaning. And so um, they were making the colony of Natal, but at the same time, there was a bit of dishonesty in it in the sense that um, the Zulu people ended up very briefly, I guess, with less land than they, you know, had before. So it was all about um, Shepston being in the middle and mediating between the white settlers in Natal, a very small group, you know, and the large uh, populations of uh, Zulu-speaking Africans who were already living there. So the subtitle is African Autonomy and Settler Colonialism in the Making of Traditional Authority. Uh, Shepston um, rewarded um, chiefs or traditional authorities who were prepared to work with the British, um, you know, rewarded them with land, and so in that way gained their um, support. So as you can see, it's more complicated. It's not just always about battles and people being killed. <laughs> Um, here's a map of what South Africa looked like in the 19th century. I see the map uh, date is 1885. Um, there were four pieces of land, really, colonies. The big, massive Cape Colony, which uh, Cape Town was part of. Okay, and then as you go up the coast on the eastern side, you can see the colony of Natal. Above the colony of Natal, there was at that time still the independent Zulu kingdom, which later got destroyed and incorporated into the colony of Natal. And then there were, to the north, there were two um, self-proclaimed uh, Boer republics. This is, uh, I guess, Dutch settlers who had moved away from the Cape to escape British control 
and they had set up their own republics in the north of the country. So that was the Orange Free State and the South African Republic, which was also known as the Transvaal. Um, but largely, a large part of South Africa was under British um, control. So what I want to explain today is how new spatial demarcations came into being in the 19th century. And the biggest one is between the land that had been privatized for settler agriculture, right? That meant um, it had been uh, laid out as a farm and it now had a private land owner who was a settler or, um, you know, you couldn't, I'll speak about that later. There were very few black landowners, but mainly um, white landowners. And um, there was this division then between that land and land that had been designated as so-called native reserve land. That means um, it was under the control of the chiefs. So it, uh, we would now call that um, communal land. It, it didn't have, doesn't have private ownership, but it has community ownership. So you then had private versus communal. So the 19th century um, is characterized by a, a particular type of spatial politics, which created a landscape of segregation. This is all before apartheid. So um, you end up with um, rather a divided landscape already before you get to apartheid. Um, and there were some dispossessions, I guess, um, associated with setting up the settler farms. The, these divisions, the division between the settler farms, privately owned, and the native reserves uh, became set in concrete, really, after those four different parts of South Africa united to become a single country, the Union of South Africa. That happened in 1910, and it wasn't long before the new country passed a consolidated law. And I'm sure you've heard about this. It's a very famous law, um, or let's say infamous, because it's famous for bad reasons, called the 1913 Natives Land Act. Uh, this really had a map supporting it, and this map set out the boundaries um, of these native uh, uh, areas under communal land, um, where the boundaries of that would be, and then where the boundaries of private property would be. This pretty much set up the scene for the 20th century. Uh, it was changed slightly when there was a new act passed in 1936, but it was a New version of the old act it kind of expanded the land a little bit and created a trust which would administer um, the land. It was called the Natives Trust and Land Act. I'm not going to expect you to know a lot about all the names of the different laws, but I think at least you should know the 1913 Natives Land Act. Um, what a lot of students don't realize is that we shouldn't think that all black South Africans um, had to live in these native reserves. It wouldn't have actually been physically possible. Um, some areas of the country hardly had any native reserves. Uh, although in Natal, about 40% of the um, 40% of Natal was um, under native reserve land and administered by the by the trust. But um, there still needed to be lots of place for um, Africans to live on, on settler-owned farms. And I would say, hmm, I couldn't give a percentage, but maybe half the African population continued to live and work on land that was now settler-owned farms. How did they do that? Well, they would negotiate that and they would say, OK, we'll stay on the land, we'll stay on your farm and we'll provide you with labor uh, from the homestead. So the Numzan, the head of the homestead, would make this agreement on behalf of his family 
and the farmer would uh, with the farmer and their farmer would say fine you can establish your homestead um, and uh, and very important um, is um, access to grazing for cattle on the land so you can have your cattle on the land but just as long as you provide me with the labor that I needed that I need so the name for people who have that arrangement is labor tenants they're not actually um, paying rent to be on the land but they are paying in their labor and I've got some photographs here I think you know from my own research in Natal where I've got some photographs of families who have for years been labor tenants on a farm well I haven't got the people quite yet so these are the cattle running on the farm this is privately owned land but they're allowed to be there as labor tenants cattle are extremely important for Nguni societies so um, is it Klosa speaking people is it Zulu speaking people and um, a lot of other groups cattle is uh, very central to the whole economy okay there's our first glimpse of the people so they have their homestead um, on the farm and they're allowed to stay there through the goodwill of the farmer um, and this is a portrait of the whole family group in the bottom right hand corner is my research assistant Keta having a drink of something and um, as you can see lots of children and it's like the families in the homestead the women looking after them okay so that just gives you a sense of the kinds of landscapes that I'm talking about as well it is important to mention and I mentioned it very briefly just now is that some black South Africans had even become landowners um, they had done well in whatever trade they had been doing in the 19th century many of these people came from mission um, communities they valued education they were involved in agriculture and on entrepreneurship different forms of entrepreneurship and were working hard to become an educated black middle class so there was also a small group of um, African landowners if you um, know the term Amakowa this is the group of people they are um, educated black middle class some of whom are land were landowners uh, uh, and they are going to become the target of dispossession during the apartheid period all right and now we've reached the apartheid period uh, I hope you're still following me here so before the apartheid period we really had land dispossession it was happening as settler farmers were moving in um, and establishing farms um, there was already segregation between you know land designated for African occupation native land as such you know and private land ownership so that was how the situation was in 1948 in 1948 the apartheid government came into power in South Africa well put it this way the National Party won the elections in 1948 and came into power and they came into power to implement their policy and their policy was called apartheid if you look at the word apart and then hate means apartness apartness an ideology of apartness so it was very much a geographical and spatial ideology there was going to be complete they wanted complete se uh, spatial separation um, of all the people in the country they weren't happy that there was mixing they wanted um, as far as possible spatial separation of people according to the race that they were categorized as now to achieve this ideology in reality um, they were prepared to go pretty far 
in achieving that. Uh, they realized it would involve large-scale social engineering, and they were prepared to go down um, that route. Uh, this is where I think South Africa became uh, correctly viewed as um, a society which was um, should not be admitted to um, well, put it this way, but South Africa correctly became seen as a pariah of nations due to this policy of apartheid. The international community rejected this policy. Um, but when it began in the 1950s, um, you know, there wasn't much talk about it internationally. Part of the strategy uh, that they had, the apartheid government, was to designate many or most of the existing communal lands, you know, the native reserves as such, um, and to rename them. And the name that was given to these lands was uh, homeland. The idea was that every black person in South Africa should belong to a homeland within South Africa. The hope there was that they would be able to spatially consolidate the homelands so that they could become independent countries within South Africa. South Africa would remain white, and then these independent homelands um, remain white, would become white, I suppose, become white, and these independent homelands would become independent countries um, where black people would, would live, and they would have passports and everything for those so-called countries. And uh, here they are. There were 10 of them, these uh, little countries. Um, they weren't real countries, of course. You can either use the word homeland, which is the nice word the government used, or you can use the word Bantu Stan, Bantu Stan, which is the word that critics used. So there was a Bantu Stan um, in the Cape former Cape Colony called the Siskai, another bigger one called the Transkai. I know many people in the class are from these places. Um, you then have some other um, large ones up in the north. You can see uh, the Potatswana, um, Kangwani. Kangwani is going to come up in one of your tutorial readings, actually this week's tutorial readings. Kangwani, homeland. Uh, Gazankulu, Venda, Laboa, um, and then in the eastern part of the country, uh, Natal and Zululand, all those areas that Shepston had negotiated with the chiefs in the 19th century, they all became part of a homeland called KwaZulu. KwaZulu, KwaZulu of course, hmm, never managed to look very consolidated. It's just little bits and pieces of land, as you can see there, um, if you look at Natal. And then, of course, you have the Kwakwa homeland as well, uh, which is by the Free State. I think I mentioned all 10. Anyway, there were 10 of them. Um, of them, uh, two of them accepted independence from South Africa and tried to claim that they were countries. They even issued passports and everything like that. So the Siskai and the Transkai, they issued passports. And I think also the Putitswana as well. They had their own universities. They, were, they had their own parliaments. Um, they were setting up to be like little countries inside South Africa. They were set up like that. So how are you going to achieve that crazy map? you're going to have to move a lot of people around the drawing board. Because if you look at the country and where people were living before this policy, you know, there was a lot of mixing. People were all over the place. If you were going to actually create these homelands and make them look like real countries, you had to consolidate them and try and make them look like a country with a border around it and everything. Okay, so you were going to have to move people that were not in the homeland and moved them there. Um, 
and there were forced removals for this reason. And this type of removal is called a removal for homeland consolidation. So there would be a bureaucrat in Pretoria that would be looking at the map and saying, well, this area, um, there's a tribe of people living here under this chief. Why are they living there? They must actually be in the nearest homeland. So they have to move there. Um, forcible removals, uh, which were state-sponsored, they were done by the state, and there was no reason for them other than the, I guess, well, in retrospect and even at the time, crazy, crazy ideas, you know, of the apartheid government about spatial segregation. So that was one type of forced removal, removals for homeland consolidation. The tutorial that you've done this week, you'll see that um, the people that were being interviewed by Metha and his uh, research assistant are in the Kangwani homeland. So they were removed um, to a homeland. Okay. Most of the forced removals, people were sent to these um, designated homelands. We can also look at other types of forced removals that happened. There were removals of people from farms that um, were actually black owned. These uh, farms were now designated as black spots by the state. Um, this idea of a black spot because all the surrounding farms around it were, had been purchased by white people and privately owned. And I think the state never really expected that black people would also buy farms. And um, they had done so. So now these farms, 50 years later after they'd been purchased, are now suddenly seen as being in the wrong place and they're designated as black spots. The mission community is the same. So the idea was that the map should look white in that area. And so these people should be forcibly removed from their land. Even though they had title deeds, this did happen. Uh, of course, there was resistance to removals. So in these struggles over landscape and power in the um, landscape, um, there was resistance, all forms of resistance from actual physical resistance to symbolic acts of resistance, which you're reading about in your reading this week. Okay, and then another form of um, forced removal that happened in this period, the 50s to the 80s, was um, the idea that uh, there were too many black people in the countryside. And so the system of labor tenancy, which allowed a lot of black people to live on white owned land, this um, the state did not like at all. And they tried to ban the system. And that was another source of forced removals because they would say that the labor tenant families, like the ones I showed you in that picture, were not supposed to be there anymore. So they were removed from white owned farms. There was a lot of paranoia at the time about the feeling that the countryside was too black. Um, of course, they'd been there all the time, but suddenly it was a problem because of the apartheid ideology. And uh, then the fourth um, category of forced removals, which is probably one you're quite familiar with if you grew up in Cape Town, um, is the removals of populations in cities. Uh, this had a specific act, the Group Areas Act, which was passed in 1950. And um, that led to um, people being moved out of areas where they had been living mixed. And the idea was that now if you were black, you had to live with black people in residential areas, black people only uh, in a township, usually at a distance from the city center. And then um, in Cape Town, of course, a lot of colored people were moved out of central Cape Town and to the Cape Flats. So it was after that, of course, as well, that you know, um, 
the University of the Western Cape was created as being the colored university. So the entire society was going to be structured around race with um, the different races being kept separate as, uh, as far as possible. And they went pretty far with this. Uh, uh, it was repressive, it was state policy, and there were laws that were passed that created the segregated um, map of the country in the countryside and in cities. Of course, it was never fully realized. People resisted, but they did go a long way with this. So when we talk about dispossession, we're talking about landscapes of dispossession. We're talking about landscapes of struggle where the state intervened to um, claim power over people living in the land and make them move somewhere else. That's what we're meaning by dispossession. And um, the forms of dispossession are, are, are um, worth studying. It's not just the loss of the physical land, it's also loss of identity, uh, loss of history and so on that's involved uh, with dispossession because it's not just land, it's landscape which has meaning. So going back to the Moran reading, landscape um, landscapes have meaning. So many South African landscapes became what I'm calling landscapes of dispossession. Uh, you can see in this picture that was taken during the apartheid period, there is a man who, together with his few belongings, um, he's got them loaded on a truck and he's being moved. It looks like to some desolate you know, area. Um, and the expression on his face is very telling, I think. Uh, this is showing a few things. Um, one of the things about this policy is it was a geographical policy and maps had a lot of power in the policy. So the state planners would look on a map and you can see them in the top left corner there, um, looking at the map and deciding which parts and which um, farms were correctly situated and which were badly situated in terms of their apartheid ideology and who should be moved and where they should be moved to. Um, the bottom left, you can see the conditions in some of the camps because people were often removed to resettlement camps um, and told to start a new life there uh, in, in a homeland. Um, they weren't given much, they were just given um, a temporary tent, temporary water, and they had to try and start again. They often lost all, all their possessions um, and livestock and so on in the move. Um, and then on the right uh, is, of course, the urban forced removals as a result of the Group Areas Action. So you've got uh, a headline, District 6, the end of their world, because District 6 was um, destroyed. Um, uh, District 6 was part of Cape Town, um, near central Cape Town. It's where the current campus of CPUT is, in central Cape Town. And um, there's not much left of it now, hardly anything. Um, and uh, coloured communities and whoever was living in District 6 had to leave and, and go um, to various locations on the Cape Flats, like Mitchell's Plain and so on. So I don't want to, this is a very depressing lecture. We've got a very difficult history to cope with in our country around land and landscapes. Um, but just to end on maybe a little bit more positive note, um, and I'm going to have a lecture on land restitution. Um, the questions we're going to be raising in this section is to say, you know, can landscapes be reclaimed and rehabilitated after after dispossession? How easy is it to do that? So we've made an attempt to do that in South Africa by passing a law. Um, it was passed really early on in the new, you know, post-apartheid period. Um, 1994, it was called the Restitution of Land Rights Act. 
and this set in process a uh, process of claiming for land that you had been removed from. And it's very important to know that in this legislation, you had to prove that you were forcibly removed due to a racially discriminatory law, you know, like those we discussed, the apartheid laws. And they also made the decision that they were only going to look at 20th century dispossession. Only um, people that had been removed after the 1913 Natives Land Act, and they weren't going to go back to the 19th century. Uh, and there was a process put in place by the state to try and um, see if we couldn't get, you know, some of that history reversed. So there were now landscapes of restitution um, that that we can and are going to be speaking about. Uh, but first of all, a bit more, you know, on dispossession. Um, this is a book about the land restitution program. The cover of the book shows um, the state uh, tractor bulldozing somebody's home. Um, and it's called, We Want What Is Ours, Learning from South Africa's Land Restitution Program. So that's quite an interesting, important book about what's happened, because we've now had 20 years of land restitution, um, more than 20, 25 years since 94. Okay, and a lot of people got their land back, returning to land. This is a ceremony where they're celebrating um, getting land back. Um, as I say, I didn't want to end on a totally depressing note, so, so here's um, happy people at a ceremony claiming the land back after a painful history of dispossession. So that's um, the end of this lecture. I uh, hope it's given you a broad historical overview and allowed you to understand the context for the tutorial reading this week. The tutorial reading is all about the Ngomani people. Ngomani people um, used to live on farms, white-owned farms in Mpumalanga. Okay, and then they were um, told they couldn't stay there anymore during apartheid. They were um, told that they had to relocate to the Kangwani homeland. They had a chief who tried to resist. Uh, the resistance crumbled um, and they were forcibly removed. And so when the researcher interviewed them, the researcher uh, Charles Maver and his research assistant had to track them down in the homeland and was trying to talk to them about the forced removals, about the history, and looking specifically at the whole concept of resistance. And remember that we're not looking only at physical resistance, but also at symbolic forms of resistance. So I think it's a fascinating reading. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and that's the one that's very much linked to this lecture. Thanks so much. And that's the end of lecture two.